Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar on evidence-based neurorehabilitation, a 2021 perspective. As a leading supplier of neurorehabilitation products, Performance Health are committed to providing clinical education and are delighted to host the first of three webinars in our neurological series. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wallamudigal people of the Darug Nation, traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respect to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in tonight's event. We will hold a Q&A section at the end of this presentation in which you will have the opportunity to ask questions either verbally or by typing in your questions. During the Q&A section, to ask a question verbally, please raise your hand by clicking the raise hand icon. We will see that your hand is raised and we will unmute you to ask a question. You will also have the opportunity to type in your question via the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address the questions during this section. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within three business days with a link to review the recording. Now I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for tonight, Dr. Marlena Clake. Marlena Clake is an occupational therapist and researcher at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. She has more than 20 years of clinical experience working within the neurosciences field in all contexts, including acute hospital, rehabilitation and home-based services. In the last 10 years, Marlena has focused on health services research with a particular interest in the use of technology. She was a member of the team who established the first publicly funded technology driven upper limb rehabilitation service. Marlena prospectively identified barriers and enablers to the use of technology in clinical practice and developed a tailored approach to the training, resources and implementation of the clinic, which continues to function six years later. Marlena is also a postdoctoral research fellow in implementation science. Her research focuses on assisting individuals, teams and organisations to develop innovations and interventions that can sustainably be used to address evidence practice gaps. Thank you for being here with us tonight, Marlena. Thank you. Thanks for that lovely introduction. I'm going to get myself sorted out here with my um, presentation. Um, please do let me know if I share anything random on the screen. I have practice, so I hope we're all seeing the right slides and I'm kind of vaguely confident um, that, that we are. But if I do put something up and it's not, it looks like it's not what it's meant to be, just send me a message in chat and I will endeavour to fix that up. Um, okay, many thanks for the introduction. Um, and to all of you who are attending tonight, most likely after a busy day at work, Today is the first webinar in a series of three that focus on neurorehabilitation. And today's session reviews the evidence for effective strategies. So I'll begin by quickly reviewing statistics for stroke and then defining and describing neurorehabilitation. We'll look at evidence, including clinical guidelines, systematic reviews and various publications. And then we'll start to unpack the question of whether we're delivering best practice in neurorehabilitation. So my aim is to finish today's webinar by about 7.15 so that we can have enough time for questions. And I do encourage you to use a Q&A tool and I'll do my best to answer questions after the presentation is finished. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the elders, both past, present and emerging of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the lands on which the Royal Melbourne Hospital services are located. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands which you are on today. You've already heard a bit about me from Cheryl's lovely introduction. So we know that I'm an occupational therapist who's specialised in neurological rehabilitation. Um, and we also know that I'm the leader for allied health research at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in implementation science. And what that basically means is that I spend a lot of time working out what strategies help clinicians and organisations to translate evidence into practice. I also teach about re rehabilitation and neuro rehab at postgrad level. Um, and on a personal note, and probably most people don't know this about me, um, one of the reasons that I'm even more passionate about neuro rehabilitation is that my dad had a stroke about five years ago. 
So I've had firsthand experience as a family member of someone who's undergone neurorehabilitation. And you can see a picture of him there rocking his Akubra hat um, next to me. And he's doing really well. Um, so I also need to declare that most of today's presentation focuses on the upper limb, as that's my area of expertise. But I do discuss evidence for neurorehabilitation strategies for other areas, such as gait and general ADL function. All right, so let's start by looking at some statistics before we dive into neuro rehab concepts and models. Um, we've had tremendous advances in the last probably 15 to 20 years in the diagnosis and acute management of stroke. And that's really seen quite a significant decrease in mortality rates. However, global incidence remains high with an estimated 13.6 million people diagnosed with stroke annually. And stroke is still a leading cause of disability in high income countries. Um, in Australia, 56,000 people will experience a stroke every year, and these numbers are predicted to increase. We, we know that the population is ageing, so that's not a surprise. Um, and we predict one stroke for every nine minutes in Australia alone. 69% of patients present to hospitals with a stroke, who present to hospitals with a stroke, have an upper limb impairment. Um, and only 50% of those will regain some useful upper limb function at the six month mark. So impaired upper limb function following a stroke is associated with anxiety and poorer perception of quality of life and well-being. And the costs associated with loss of productivity following a stroke are really quite extraordinary. It's estimated to be about $5 billion a year. And along with that, care costs are estimated to be an additional $222 million a year. So despite the incredible advances that we've made in acute stroke management, Working out what's most effective in terms of stroke rehab strategies is still critically important to all of us. And that's the survivors of stroke, their families, carers, clinicians, and funding bodies. So let's have a look at what, what neuro rehabilitation is. So rehabilitation is a process um, and it's a process that aims to enable people with disabilities to reach and maintain their optimal physical, sensory, intellectual, psychological, social functional levels. Rehab provides people who have a disability with the tools that they need to maintain independence and self-determination. A neuro rehabilitation focuses on delivering rehabilitation to and with individuals who have been born with or acquired a neurological condition. And that includes, but not limited to stroke, brain injury, injuries, um, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's disease, brain tumors, encephalitis, um, and I'm sure all of you could add plenty more to that list. Neurorehabilitation should be client-centered, um, and we all know that. Um, anybody who's been practicing for the last 20 years would be very familiar with the client-centered model. Um, and it ensures that the treating team considers the patient's values and preferences when making clinical decisions. Family and friends of the patients are also important stakeholders and increasingly they're supporting rehabilitation outside of the constraints of our work hours as we start to move more towards that concept of rehab being a 24 hour a day proposition. Neurological rehabilitation should be directed by the goals set with the patient and these should be measurable and focus on reducing disability and increasing participation. And the World Health Organization recommends an interdisciplinary model of care for rehabilitation. Uh, and we all know that an interdisciplinary team is a group of health professionals from a variety of fields or disciplines who work together towards the same goal as determined and prioritised with the patient and their family and carers. Um, and the team, it's going to vary from setting to setting. Um, typically, we would see re rehabilitation consultants and nurses, um, physios, OT, speeches, social workers, um, psychologists, um, music therapists, and I'm sure that, again, we can add more. Neuro rehab is a process. Um, it's not a building and it's not a room. It's not a place. Um, it's not about fancy equipment. Uh, I've been lucky enough to teach neuro rehabilitation in a number of developing countries and none of those countries have had particularly sophisticated buildings or, or equipment, but they still have the capacity to deliver exceptional neuro rehabilitation. The model of care is constantly changing and evolving, and we've particularly seen that since COVID-19 hit. So the traditional pathway for neurorehabilitation was from the acute setting to rehabilitation if needed, then home with community supports. 
And now we're increasingly seeing a rehabilitation in the home type of model where patients who are medically stable go directly from acute to home and are visited by the neuro rehab team in their homes. Um, and I'm certainly familiar across Victoria, quite a number of services who are using that model. And I'm, I wouldn't doubt that that's happening across Australia or in other areas also. Um, and we're also increasingly seeing the use of telehealth platforms to deliver home-based rehabilitation. Irrelevant of where the patient begins or ends their rehabilitation journey, there are some critical steps that guide our practice as rehabilitation clinicians. Um, when we first meet our patient, our priority is to work out what's going on with this person. So first step is usually to complete relevant assessments so we can start developing some hypotheses. I love this part. Um, our selection of assessments are typically influenced by a lot of different factors, um, including the patient's presentation. That'll often give us a suggestion around what we need to look at first. Um, it's also influenced by the availability of, of assessments in our workplace. Uh, we can't all have all the assessments we want, so sometimes we can just work with what we have at our hands or at our fingers touch. Um, it's also dictated by our patient's um, ability. So at times our patients can only sustain five or 10 minutes of engagement. So we wouldn't typically select a, an assessment that's gonna be 45 minutes in that situation. Standardized assessments are formal assessments that have been designed to measure a patient's ability and to compare those abilities to other individuals in his or her age range or gender group or occupational group. And these tests typically have normative data. And all that means is that they've been administered to enough people so that we can work out what the average level of ability is. Um, a non-standardized assessment is also really valuable too. Um, and I don't think it's about using one or the other. Most of us would use both. So non-standardized assessments, they're informal. Um, and we typically conduct these to see where a patient's strengths and abilities are, as well as identifying priorities for targeting during therapy. Non-standardized assessments also um, can measure a patient's skills or progress, but we can't compare them because there's no normative data. We do use them to compare the patient to themselves, for example. Um, so if you take video footage when your patient starts rehab and take that video footage again, that's a pretty good example of a, an informal type of assessment and still hugely valuable. Um, we also aim to reduce doubling up with our assessments and ideally take a, a multi or interdisciplinary approach. So for example, physios and OTs completing home visits together um, or completing uh, an assessment of sitting balance together as part of the process of wheelchair prescription. Then the second step in the neuro rehab process is to contextualize the patient's function. And I'm 100% sure we've all seen the ICF. Um, and we still say it's the best way to, to be able to contextualise what's happening with our patient. So the ICF is the international standard for framing, describing, recording and measuring functioning and disability. The ICF conceptualises a, a person's level of functioning um, as a dynamic interaction between all those different elements you see there. So it's an interaction between the health condition being the neurological injury that they've acquired, environmental factors and personal factors. And the ICF really sees functioning and disability on a continuum. And they're described in terms of body structures or functions and their associated impairments, activities and associated activity limitations, participation and associated participation restrictions. And environmental factors can be either a barrier or a facilitator and may indicate what needs to change so that we can support our patients to achieve their maximum level of functioning and to realise um, their right to participate in society. So I'm sure we've all had this example where you've got uh, one patient um, who's uh, got a great home set up, that they might be going home in a wheelchair, um, bathrooms downstairs, it's accessible, um, you know, a nice open wet room versus a patient who lives in a really narrow two-storey home with the bathroom upstairs. So we know in that situation, the environmental factors will mean that one patient's experience um, is, is experiencing more barriers to participation than the other. So environmental factors and personal factors play a huge role in rehabilitation. The next step in the neuro rehab process is to develop some hypotheses from the findings of our assessments and through task analysis. I'm, I'm a huge fan of task analysis as a way of really breaking down what's going on and pinpointing what's happening with my patient. Um, why are they experiencing difficulties? At what point of that movement pattern or that functional task are they experiencing difficulties? 
So I found this um, great photo on, on Google and um, we can clearly see looking at that photo uh, that this gentleman's motor patterns are atypical. Um, I think he's trying to cut up a piece of Play-Doh or something like that with, um, with cutlery, with some modified cutlery. So we can have a number of hypotheses. If, if we're doing a task analysis and we see this gentleman attempting, um, attempting to use a cutlery, we start to think to ourselves, well, what do we have to check out here? Uh, does he have motor weakness in the shoulder that's preventing him from reaching forward across and against gravity? Um, does he have increased tone in his biceps um, that's preventing him from supinating um, and extending the elbow? He's, he's pretty flexed there. Can he feel the fork? So when I'm looking at that picture, of, you know, if he was in front of me, um, I can see he's really holding on tight to that fork, um, which suggests to me that then maybe there's a sensory impairment. Maybe it's a fine motor, fine motor discoordination. Um, I start to wonder why is his left shoulder elevated? Is it because of increased tone? Um, or is it because of the effort that he, he needs to expend to grasp the fork? So we all know that many factors can impact on function after a neurological injury. And underlying assumptions about cause and effect on function or dysfunction really guide our clinical decision-making. Um, likely contributing factors need to be systematically considered and they need to be assessed. So if I'm thinking that's increased tone in the elbow, um, I need to assess if that's actually the case before I work out if my hypothesis is correct or not. Um, I, we need to be able to rule out factors that are not relevant to what's going on with this gentleman or with the patient in front of us. And that helps us to refine the analysis and to, I guess, to explain the factors that are associated with the limitations that our patients are, are experiencing um, and, and the restrictions in their participation. And of course, assumptions about motor control really guide our analysis of functional limitations and participation restrictions. And the next step, is you know, the thing that we all think about. Um, the exciting stuff, the creative stuff is delivering rehabilitation. And once again, motor learning underpins the rehabilitation process um, and it allows functional goals to be achieved and maintained. Neuro rehab should be goal, goal directed. It needs to focus on what's important for the patient. Um, the other day I listened to a podcast uh, and there was a, a young physiotherapist who, who was talking on the podcast and she'd sustained a traumatic brain injury um, a couple of years ago. And she talked about her experience of rehab and how much better her motivation and her compliance were when the therapy targeted her goal of returning to netball. So she was a really keen netball player. Um, and she talked about different activities that weren't focused on her goals and how she'd pretty much just avoid them, even though she knew as a physio that they were important and they could help her achieve, um, I guess, gains, they weren't important in terms of what she valued. And it was a really good reminder to me because I think, you know, logically, intellectually, I know it, but we all need that reminder about being goal-directed and what it means for our patients. Um, we need to find a balance between compensatory versus recovery models. I don't think it's an all or nothing um, approach. I don't think that we're going to lose uh, by using both of those approaches simultaneously. We want our patients to be as independent as possible and it's important for their mood and their self-esteem to be able to do things like um, get to their therapy independently or be able to do some self-care tasks independently. And often while we're working on recovery, we will support the patient independence through compensatory methods such as using adaptive equipment. Um, rehabilitation should begin as early as possible and uh, we, we all absolutely know that, but we need to be mindful of intensity in the acute phases. Uh, so, you know, we certainly learnt that from the findings from, from the large AVERT study that frequent lower intensity bursts are best in the acute setting. However, in the subacute setting, um, in, in, in patient rehabilitation and uh, chronic or long-term rehabilitation, intensity and frequency is, is really important. And it's something that I'm going to discuss in a lot more detail, but suffice to say that patients need to have enough time on task, enough practice to encourage neuroplasticity. Uh, generalizing goes hand in hand with task specific practice. Um, and that's undoubtedly a term that all of us have heard about and I will talk about that in more detail. We need to make sure that components of movements contribute to meaningful and purposeful movements. So what I mean by that is sometimes our patients come to us and um, we have to work on preoccupational type of movements. So they may not have the capacity to be able to do something like 
reach for, I don't know, a can of baked beans. Um, so we may just be working on um, using just minimal shoulder flexion and extension, but we need to be mindful about generalizing that to a functional task, such as reaching towards something. And finally, most importantly, we need to look at what's evidence, what's the evidence saying? Um, you know, our treatments should be evidence-based. We need to, to ask the question, well, what's effective? Um, what's recommended for this patient, um, his or her presentation, and at this stage of recovery? And finally, this is an area that I'm hugely passionate about. We need to measure progress. Um, it's really, really important. Um, and it sounds simple, and I know it's not because we're all very busy and it's hard to take, um, sometimes take outcome measures. Uh, but I would ask, how do we know what is or isn't working if we don't measure? And outcome measurements um, can be aimed at any level of, of the patient. So we can look at impairment types of measures. Um, so are they changing, for example, in their range? Um, or we can look at activities or participation. And most often we really look at all three, certainly in, um, in rehabilitation and ambulatory services, we tend to look at all three. Uh, our selection of outcome measurement tools really depend on what's appropriate for our patient. Um, we need to be mindful of the psychometric properties. And I guess most important there is knowing that if we're gonna select a, a tool there, measurement tool, we need to know that it's valid to use with our patient. So for example, if our patient's um, living in the community, has that tool been validated for community dwelling patients or is it really for patients um, who, are, who are acute or in patients? Um, and I, I would really recommend that at the very least, we take measures at the beginning and at discharge. Um, and it may not be the end of the patient's rehabilitation process, but it's useful if we can hand over that information and it lets the patient know as well the, the progress that they've made across their rehabilitation journey. Let's look at current evidence for neurorehabilitation strategies and treatments. So the Stroke Foundation is a national leader in Australia for advocating for best outcomes for survivors of stroke. Um, and gosh, they do a fabulous job with, with clinical guidelines. Um, and they produce living clinical guidelines that are updated as new evidence emerges. So it's, it's a huge task. And I, I really take my hat off the extraordinary, it's extraordinary amount of work that they do. Each recommendation is given a grading indicating how strong the evidence is. And for topics where there is either a lack of or insufficient quality evidence, the guideline panel develops statements based on consensus and expert opinion, typically guided by underlying or indirect evidence. And these statements are called practice statements and they correspond to consensus-based recommendations. I'm sure we've all heard of that or, or read about that um, in our travels. The Stroke Foundation recommends that patients get as much structured practice as possible within the first six months following a stroke. So at least, at least a minimum of one hour per day, five days per week. And they've also um, recently updated it to say that they need additional practice outside of therapy sessions. So the Stroke Foundation has found strong evidence for providing as much therapy as possible. And I'll unpack that um, in more detail in upcoming slides. Um, there's also really strong evidence for goal setting, um, which is great because you know, it's, it's something I think that we do quite well. Um, there's very strong evidence for constraint-induced movement therapy and task-specific training um, amongst a variety of other strategies. So I, I've really just taken um, a, you know, a, a little snapshot there. There's a lot more evidence in, in the actual guidelines. They also have developed practice statements for things such as active task practice outside of therapy sessions and other areas around um, perception and environmental modifications. So the purpose of clinical guidelines and these recommendations from, from organisations like the Stroke Foundation is to encourage evidence-based practice. And the evidence for treatments such as task-specific training and constraint-induced movement therapy um, relates to therapy dosage and that in turn relates to neuroplasticity. Oh, did I go? Here we go. Um, okay. so. I'm sure we've all heard um, heaps and heaps and heaps about neuroplasticity because it's um, been talked about a lot probably in the last 10 or 15 years, although it was really um, on the horizon earlier than that. Um, rehab is really built on the notion that patients can potentially achieve higher levels of function and independence through their participation in a variety of activities um, like exercise and activity programs. 
And neuroplasticity, it really just outlines how the brain can change with experience. And this phenomenon underpins the learning-based approach to rehab. So I've said it a few times, I've talked about motor learning, and there is a relationship obviously between motor learning and neuroplasticity. So the type of experience that you and I as clinicians provide for our patients actually guides the way in which the brain adapts following a neurological event. Um, and I'm just going to ask my, my colleague Cheryl to play a very quick YouTube um, clip about um, a very simple explanation of neuroplasticity. <laughs> Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence, neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel or do something. Some of these roads are well-travelled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task or choose a different emotion, we start carving out a new road. If we keep travelling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. Thank you. Thanks for that. I just want to make sure that I actually end up on the right screen here. So if I'm on the wrong screen, somebody just send me a message and say, hey, you're on the wrong screen. Um, so thanks for that, Cheryl. Um, I, I really like that um, that clip. I do realise that it's a, a pretty simple, um, sorry, I'm just going to have a look at the chat. Oh, okay. Thank you everyone for that. I've had this this problem of how I share my screen throughout the day. So I'll see if I can change that now. Does that look good? What about now? Still seeing, okay. Give me one second. And let's see if I choose option number D. Am I good now? Oh, thank you, everyone. <laughs> it's really hard, you know, when you've got dual monitors, nothing's really straightforward. Um, so thank you very much for that feedback. Um, so I was just saying how much I really enjoy that very simple, um, simple video or clip from YouTube. I know it doesn't work like that, and I'm going to go through and show some uh, functional MRIs, which is a little bit more realistic, um, but it just tells us a little bit about why or how neuroplasticity works. So how does the rehabilitation that you and I deliver contribute to neuroplasticity? So this is a really classic study here, and I, I really love pulling this out and reminding myself about it. Um, a group of researchers conducted an experiment to identify patterns of brain activation change that drive recovery. Yep, um, that drive recovery um, in response to rehabilitation. So they enrolled 23 chronic stroke survivors and 11 healthy controls. The intervention group participated in upper limb therapy for five hours a day 
five days a week over 12 weeks. I feel like that's constraint induced. They didn't call it that, but oh, I suspect it was. Maybe they just didn't know about CIMT. Um, the type of therapy that was delivered was high repetition task or task component specific training along with generalization. And so that's sort of explained there um, at the side um, of that slide. Uh, outcomes measured included functional MRI during reach and there's also a range of clinical measures. This is really interesting what they found. So they found that there was two types of neuroplastic changes. Um, and I know I mentioned before that they were chronic stroke, but I wanna mention that again, um, because I think it's really important to know that people beyond six months um, of having acquired a stroke can continue to change. And here's a really good example of it. So two types of neuroplastic changes, both were associated with improvement in reach as per clinical measures. The, so the first type of neuroplastic change was actually a decrease in task-related brain activation. And the second was an increase in task-related brain activation. So they found that participants with better motor function at baseline decreased in brain activation following treatment, particularly in the ipsilateral primary motor and contralateral supplementary motor regions. Um, and, and I guess I, I, I see that as being those, those with, um, with higher level function at the beginning refine or um, through their rehabilitation, they're actually able to use less, they need to use less or harness less parts of their brain. So I'm not, I'm not surprised by that finding. And participants with a poorer motor uh, function at baseline increased in brain activation in bilateral primary motor and contralateral primary secondary um, regions. So you can see that really nicely here. Um, so here we have the pre-rehab and here we have post. So I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that that's neuroplasticity, but also it's going to, it can potentially affect both sides of the brain. So it's not just about harnessing contralateral areas, um, but certainly ipsilateral as well. Um, and these researchers concluded that recovery of reach involves recruitment of both ipsilateral and contralateral regions, and the direction of functional brain change depends on baseline level of motor function. But a beautiful example of how the brain changes um, with adequate rehabilitation. So studies have found there are a number of factors that maximize experience dependent neuroplasticity. Uh, Cl Klein and Jones, some researchers who have suggested there are 10 principles for us to think about uh, to maximize neuro rehab and encourage neuroplasticity. Use it or lose it is the one that we've got there at the top. That's no surprise. Um, that's the case for anything that you wanna learn. So it refers to functional degradation, secondary um, to a failure to drive specific brain functions. Um, I was talking about this yesterday and saying that if I had a choice between a patient uh, moving badly versus not moving at all, I, I would rather that they moved in a dodgy sort of way so that we don't lose that sort of mapping, that cortical mapping. So use it or lose it is kind of the first premise of neuro rehab. Uh, use it and improve it. So training that drives a specific brain function can lead to an enhancement of that function. Specificity, I talk a lot about specificity. So that's the nature of the training experience um, and that dictates the plasticity. That's really important. And I'll go through some slides about that. Repetition matters. So induction of plasticity needs sufficient repetition. Uh, intensity matters. Uh, induction of plasticity requires sufficient training. Um, Time matters, different forms of plasticity occur at different times during training. Salience matters. So the training experience has to be uh, relevant, has to be relevant to the patient. And age matters. Uh, we know that training induced plasticity occurs more readily in younger brains. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen with older people. Um, it just might take a little bit longer. Transference uh, plasticity in response to one training experience uh, can enhance the acquisition of similar behaviours. And there's some really nice research happening around that, um, how the correlation between hand function and, and speech motor areas. And interference. So plasticity in response to one experience can interfere with the acquisition of other behaviours. None of that's really surprising. Um, it kind of describes how we learn throughout our life, uh, irrelevant to whether we've acquired a neurological injury or not. Let's talk about dosage. Um, so I, I showed in the slide before uh, I highlighted a few important uh, concepts. 
and dosage has been receiving quite a lot of attention. So there's no agreed on global definition for dosage, but most authors include some or all of these terms that you see before you. Um, so duration, frequency, length of rehab and active task practice. So intensity refers to how much actual practice the patient is engaging in. So for example, a 60 minute session in the gym, that might include three 10 minute breaks, as well as some chatting to, to my mate on the other treadmill. So intensity might be 28 minutes of walking on the treadmill, even though the session was 60 minutes in duration. So it's very much about time on task. Frequency refers to how often the patient comes to therapy. Is it once a fortnight, three times a week? Duration is the overall length of the session. Um, and length is the overall period of rehabilitation. You know, is it, is it like six weeks? Um, and dosage really is kind of a, a mix of all of those factors. So why do we care about dosage? So a systematic review in 2016 uh, compared extra rehabilitation with the same types of interventions. So they weren't doing anything new. So it was the same types of intervention, just more of it versus usual rehabilitation. And they looked at 14 RCTs uh, in the analysis with a total of just under a thousand patients. Um, and they pulled that data to get an estimate of what, what is the effect of extra rehab. And what the authors of this paper found was that while there was a trend towards a positive relationship between extra rehab and improved outcomes, it wasn't actually statistically significant until um, they separated trials into uh, small versus large increases in the amount of extra rehabilitation that was provided. And that's when they found that there was a statistically significant improvement. Um, and the model that they used indicated that an additional 240% of rehab was needed to improve activity or outcomes in stroke survivors. And what that meant in terms of time was the usual amount of time of rehab um, or dosage was 25 minutes per day in the control groups, um, while the average dose of extra rehabilitation to get, get the changes in the experimental group was 90 minutes. Um, and that kind of is in, in keeping with what the Stroke Foundation is recommending. So 90 minutes per day, um, but being mindful that that's, that's got to be in, intensive, you know, that's got to actually be time on task. So what about specificity? Why does that matter? And what, what in God's name is it? So specificity is about how we as rehabilitation specialists, how we design an experience for our patients that, that actually specifically targets neuroplastic changes. Um, and again, I've got this lovely um, old school, uh, but really important early study uh, that's about specificity. Um, and I'm sorry that the monkeys are in cages, um, but anyway, we won't, we, won't look at, we won't focus on that. Um, if we have a look at uh, monkey A, I'm just gonna turn on my laser pointer. So monkey A, um, he's got a task here to, to get food out of a well. And monkey A's uh, well, is, it's really small. So this, this uh, little guy's gotta use pincer grip, lateral pincer grip. Um, he's got to rotate his, his wrist and his arm and he's really got to work hard to get that pallet out. Monkey B, much luckier, he's got a huge well there. So he can just kind of go on in there and just scoop those pallets out. Might use a little bit of wrist and forearm, but he probably doesn't need to uh, use any sort of fine motor um, pinching action. And the usual fMRI that we see here, show some very interesting findings. So monkey A, who really practiced uh, a lot with his fingers, if we have a look at digit representation, we can see that he has a much, much greater activity in terms of where, where we map digits on the motor cortex. And his mate, monkey B, we can see the, the red stuff is where digit representation is, has much smaller representation. So basically this type of animal modeling shows that if we provide a specific rehab experience that focuses on using fingers, for example, then that's a neuroplastic changes that we're most likely to get. And that's the stuff that we need to be mindful of as clinicians is providing the right challenge for our patients. And why does specificity matter? So French et al uh, completed a systematic review and that looked at 33 studies with just under 2000 patients. And they explored the effects of task specific training on recovery after stroke and they compared it to usual care. Um, I couldn't really get a good handle around usual care. It seemed to be quite a mixture, but uh, more sort of exercise driven than task specific training. And what they found was um, evidence for the effectiveness of repetitive task training 
um, was that it was much more effective in terms of outcomes for arm function, for hand function, for sitting balance, functional reach, walking distance, sit to stand, functional ambulation, and much of this was maintained for up to six months post therapy. Um, and what the, the authors declared was that the review provided um, evidence and, and I'm, I'm the first to say not all of this is high quality evidence. I think that's the case across a lot of rehab findings. Low or moderate quality evidence to validate the principle that repetitive task specific training can result in functional gain when compared against other forms of usual care um, or attention control. So we've established that there's some pretty good evidence for the types of rehabilitation strategies that contribute to neuroplasticity. Um, we know that dosage appears to be important and we know that um, task specificity does as well. So let's have a quick look at whether we think we're delivering best practice neuro rehab. So the most recent audit completed by the Stroke Foundation found that 73% of services provided on average two or more hours of active therapy per day, at least five days per week. That's phenomenal. I, I think that that's just such, such exciting findings. Um, and there was a combination of group circuit classes, one-on-one -on -one therapy, allied health assistance. So there was um, a few different things going on there. I think it suggests that we as a country are, are really progressing well in terms of trying to find uh, provide volume, a good amount of volume of therapy. When we start to drill um, a little further into the data, we can see that 72% um, of patients assessed um, had an upper limb impairment. And of those um, patients who had an upper limb impairment, um, we were really great at providing the task specific training. So 87%, that's, that's really great. Less so with things like constraint induced movement therapy. Um, so we were sitting at about 11% there. Um, we, were, we had some manic, mechanically assisted training and a, a little bit of other therapy. So we've got some mixed results there. And, and I'd be the first to say that they, that may be related to the types of patients that are presenting to rehabilitation. It's hard to tell. Um, you have to meet a lot of criteria to actually uh, be considered for constraint-induced movement therapy. Uh, but let's have a look at what published studies say on this topic as well. So Lang and colleagues um, examined the number of repetitions or time on task in physio and OT outpatient rehab sessions um, for people who had hemiparesis post-stroke. Um, and they observed 36 treatment sessions and they pretty much just stood there and recorded what activities were being undertaken. So they're kind of like flies on the wall and they counted the number of repetitions that were completed. And they categorized the movements as being either active exercise, which is any movement where the patient was instructed to move their limb um, from a resting position through a specific motion or passive exercise where the therapist moved the limb or purposeful movement, which was more goal, more goal directed. So um, practicing things like reaching for a cup. And what they found was a really low number of repetitions of movements, particularly purposeful movements. So there was a mean of 12 reps for purposeful upper limb movements. And assuming that a session was 36 minutes long, which was the, the mean length of the session, plus or minus 14 minutes, um, that's one purposeful movement every three minutes. Uh, similar study by Kimberly et al. Um, they looked at both patients with stroke and patients with TBI, and they analyzed data from 48 patients and 40 therapists, and they looked at a total of 107 therapy sessions. And they found that the average number of repetitions per session was 14.5 functional movements, um, which is roughly one movement every 2.3 minutes. So it's almost the same as, as what Lang found. Um, now, both of those studies had, Lang's study was in rehabilitation, Kimberley's study was in rehabilitation as well as in the acute setting. So there's a lot of hypotheses around factors that um, can be, that might be contributing to um, the difficulties that we're experiencing in, in providing things like constraint induced or high therapy dosage. Um, regaining upper limb function following a stroke is, it's really challenging. It's challenging for us as clinicians um, and it's challenging for, for the patient. Um, so first up, many stroke survivors, they, they can do a lot of ADLs with the, the, the other arm, the unaffected arm. Um, and, and I've seen this heaps of time. So, you know, they just shift to using the other arm. That, that really can evolve quite quickly into a learned non-use pattern. Um, and it all also really then focuses on that compensatory training and less time on motor learning. 
And secondly, patients, they, they present with combinations of impairments. I'm, I'm yet to find anyone who's got just one impairment. So often there's abnormal muscle tone, there might be sim some sensory changes, um, motor weakness. So rehab can be lengthy. You know, it takes some time to be able to actually address some of those impairment areas and some of the functional goals. Um, most patients have some level of cognitive impairment and they can further contribute to, to poor outcomes. So, you know, disorders of attention and perception, um, you know, are they going to comply uh, with, with the therapy that we're setting up for them with the extra practice? And, and of course, there are all the organisational factors. So reducing length of stay, it's much less now than what, it's, what it was 10 years ago in subacute services. Um, there's not a lot of resources necessarily available, and that's time, for example. Clinicians um, have really big caseloads as well. So it becomes really difficult to, to deliver the dosage that's recommended. So is there any evidence that might assist in addressing gaps in service delivery? I'm just going to quickly check this chat. All right, thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to rush through this because I can see it's already 7.15. Um, so neuro rehab is changing at a rapid pace. And with that, we've got some emerging evidence. Um, I'm, I'll just move on to the next slide. This is just an example of different types of emerging technologies that there are. So I can go from simple as Wii gaming all the way up to immersive virtual reality. Um, let's have a look at the evidence for these different types of technologies. So Stroke Foundation recommendations. Um, so they've started to include some information around emerging technologies and the role that they can play in rehabilitation. So there's weak recommendations, um, which suggests that uh, the, 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 the evidence is growing, but the quality isn't quite there, but often consumers are asking for it. So for upper limb weakness, they recommend repetitive practice using robotics, for upper limb activity, arm training using robotics, virtual reality and interactive games, uh, particularly within the first six months, and for standing virtual reality training, visual or auditory feedback, um, electromechanical assisted gait or standing. So there's quite a few stroke foundation recommendations around the use of emerging technologies. So what's the evidence for emerging technologies and are they effective? Um, a recently updated Cochrane review in 2018, 45 trials, over 1600 participants, and they found that emerging technologies does improve ADLs and arm function and arm muscle strength. Um, one of the things that they found in this updated version is that the quality of the evidence is actually better. Um, in the earlier version of this Cochrane review is actually quite poor. So they found that the quality of evidence was high. Um, however, it was difficult to pull results because there's so much variation in how the devices are, are used and the studies and what they're measuring. So they concluded that there's strong evidence that the use of virtual reality and interactive video gaming can be beneficial in improving upper limb function and ADL function. Um, and about six years ago, we implemented a tech-based upper limb rehab clinic at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And we certainly saw improvement in all of these areas. Um, so and I'm not going to go into detail about how we set the service up because that's something we'll discuss at the next webinar. Um, but I do, did wanna show you what our results were. Uh, we measured results for 92 patients uh, that came through. We've actually had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients that have come through since then. And we certainly saw some great uh, improvements in arm function, strength, tone, um, quality of life, um, exactly what was shown in the Cochrane review. And one of the most common questions I get asked is um, how we've actually sustained the hand hub and, and how is it still going? And we've never really had funding for it. Um, and that, that is something that we'll go into more detail um, in, that ne in the next webinar. And it's something that I, I actually research quite closely now in my postdoctoral role. So I've got some, some ideas about why, why these sorts of interventions might stick and, and why they might not. Um, I'm really gonna quickly whiz through this because I'm conscious of time. Um, but I, I did want to talk about future direction and particularly how clinicians like you and I can shape industry to deliver um, what we and our patients want and need. Um, so this um, revoltingly complex model we see in front of us is, is about translation of innovations from the laboratory all the way to clinical practice. And traditionally, clinicians weren't um, consulted during the development phase. Um, 
engineers in industry made stuff and they made stuff on the basis of mathematical principles and software designs and mechatronics and all those sorts of fancy words. And these devices would undergo some pilot testing with a couple of patients maybe, um, most typically still in a laboratory or a research site. Clinicians may or may not have been involved at that stage, typically not. And then the big leap was made to attempt to translate the devices into the rehab setting. And at this stage, the clinicians receive a device and perhaps they've bought it or they've been offered a free trial. But because there's been relatively little input from clinicians, the devices rarely meet our needs. Um, they can be complex to set up. Um, they can take 20 minutes of faffing to get your patient strapped in. Um, you need to be a bit of a tech whiz to troubleshoot the various some um, issues that arise. Um, and then we're left saying, but I just want a simple and easy to use device that's safe for my patients. So it's no wonder that um, uptake has been problematic. Um, and I'm really happy to say that that's really starting to change. So we're now seeing clinicians being involved in the initial design phase, like right at the beginning when it was just engineering. And we're being asked, what do we want? Um, we're being asked, how do we want the devices to move? Um, and what's most important for us in using these devices in rehab? And that's really important because that's what enhances acceptability. Um, if clinicians and consumers don't find a treatment or a device acceptable, we're not likely to use a device. The device doesn't meet our needs, it's not gonna be feasible and we're not gonna use it. Um, and there's no way to sustain using a device beyond a pilot phase if no one's asked us as the primary users what we need to make these devices acceptable. So I'm really pleased to see that that's changing and hopefully we'll see more devices hit the market that are developed by patients and clinicians along with engineers. But thank you so much, everyone, for, for attending. And I'm so sorry I went um, six minutes over. That's not so bad. I'm going to hand over to Cheryl now to uh, facilitate the Q&A session. Thank you, Marlena, for such a great and comprehensive information session. We will now open up for questions. As a reminder, if you do have a question, please type your question via the Q&A box located on the toolbar. To ask a question verbally, please raise your hand by clicking the raise hand icon we will see that your hand is raised and we will unmute you to ask a question. So we've got our first question for tonight, Marlena, from Hassan. Thanks for the presentation, Marlena. I'm an exercise physio physiologist working in clinical and community settings, home visits. Regarding assessments, you mentioned recording videos. I was wondering if there are any suggestions for conducting qu quantitative assessments, especially in home settings. For example, are there any validated apps you recommend? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and actually you've just reminded me of something. Um, I, I'll get to the apps in a moment because I think there's quite a bit of work happening in the space of looking at apps. Uh, but some assessments have actually been validated for use um, to be delivered via telehealth, so via remote um, delivery. So. I'm um, pretty sure the Fugelmeyer is one that has been um, validated for use via a telehealth platform. So there are a growing number of uh, standardised assessments that you can actually use via a telehealth platform. Um, I, I think the question that you ask about apps is really important. Um, and I have, I have lots of thoughts about that. Um, there are some apps that have some, some really nice research behind them. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to give some links and I can do that um, via email, but there's literally hundreds of different apps out there and some of them will have good research behind them, some of them won't. Um, and I think we, we need to be mindful when we're looking at what the apps do to look at, um, does it meet the needs of our patients? What research has gone on behind it um, has been validated to use with our patients? So there's no straightforward yes or no answer. I know that there's a lot of work going on in the space of looking at how apps have been developed, um, breaking them down in terms of even looking at what behaviours they're wanting from our patients. Um, so that's an air, a, growing, a growing field and one that we should all be keeping our eyes on. But in terms of telehealth and standardised assessments, absolutely. Yes, there are some, some really good ones that have been validated to, to use in that way. Thank you, Marlena. We've got our next question on the line from Rebecca. And I'll just unmute you so that you can ask your question live. Hi, can you hear me okay? I can. Hi, oh, Rebecca. Good. 
Hi, Marlena. Um, I'm Becky. I'm an occupational therapist in South Australia. So I used to work um, in the brain injury rehab services in, sub in the subacute setting. And um, all of our work now is in a home based community setting. And I was just interested when you were talking about emerging technologies. And obviously, in the subacute setting, we did actually have we had a Pablo and I believe it's still there actually but as you've said we didn't use it I guess as much as we could have done at the time because it was cumbersome and it was new and it took a while to set up but I understand they use it more now I'm just thinking within a home-based setting because you know I do see quite a few patients with um with stroke and traumatic brain injury but do you think there's an opportunity in the future for maybe with engineering and you know hopefully with liaison with clinicians to make it more accessible within a home setting so it is going to be used more so for example you know just but being able to kind of connect some kind of robotic or something to their actual own device so that then in terms of that intensity they can if they've got the motivation to they can continue with that even when we're not there yeah that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I do think, um, I think there's stuff happening around that at the moment. Um, you, you know, I, I'll, I have to admit that um, I did a, I was part of a, an RCT that actually put some technology in the patient's home. Um, and that, that was a really tough study because I, I had some real difficulties with compliance with the patient. So there's a few things to consider about that. I, I, I love the thought of patients having a device to enable uh, you know, the, the practice um, that, that's really beneficial at home. One of the issues that I had was troubleshooting tech issues. Um, yeah. So yeah. a lot of my patients um, had, they, they appeared, they, they passed, for example, the, the mocha test reasonably well, but they had um, minor cognitive deficits that actually made it really difficult for them to troubleshoot tech. Um, yeah. And that was that was a bit of a barrier for me, but as technology is changing and it's really, I mean, the, the progress in the last few years um, has really gone in leaps and bounds. And as we reduce some of those tech sort of barriers, I do see the capacity uh, for, you know, more devices to be able to be used at home with some sort of a computer interface. Um, but I still think that we need to be, we need to consider how we're going to support the patients um, in that context. Um, and then often it's, it might be about, uh, you know, training up the carer as well to do some of the troubleshooting with some of the devices. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We're going to see stuff going in the home. Um, and I've, you know, doing some work with some engineers at the moment on a small robotic device that is designed for uh, multiple settings and it's mobile and it's light um, and, it's, and it's been built with clinicians. That's exciting. Thanks, Marlena. No problems. Thank you, Rebecca. We have a question from Mickey on the chat. Just wondering when you mentioned 90 minutes of rehab daily, does it mean the intensity is needing to be 90 minutes? For example, working out for the whole 90 minutes? And an additional question to this is also, considering there could also be weakness post-stroke, does fatigue mm -hmm. and soreness post-exercises affect how much participation from patient? 90 minutes of exercise is still quite a big amount. Yeah. It is. It's a lot, isn't it? Like 90 minutes. Um, it's sort of a little bit confronting. Um, to answer the first question, um, they didn't say it was 90 minutes um, specifically on task practice, as in they were sitting there for 90 minutes, um, you know, focusing on something. Um, but if we look at, if we unpack treatments like constraint induced, that is a couple of hours of, of active practice, of sitting there and doing the repetitions of the movements. And that's probably one of the treatments that has um, one of the largest evidence bases behind it in terms of um, neuroplasticity. Um, so yes, they did get significant changes with the 90 minutes, um, didn't declare, they didn't say that it was necessarily 90 minutes task on practice, but there's a lot of evidence to say that the more intensity or more time on practice, the larger the changes are going to be. And it is tricky when we've got patients who are experiencing fatigue. Um, if we've got patients um, who have upper limb pain, we have to select treatments that are appropriate for the patient who's presenting before us. Um, so it mightn't be the right time for them. And on, to be honest, um, in that initial subacute phase, I've personally found that a lot of my patients just want to get home and the upper limb stuff seems to come up down the track. 
they get home and uh, they seem to, I don't know, settle a little bit and go, well, I'm ready now to work on my upper limb. Whereas in that subacute setting, it's, um, and it's becoming increasingly acute, the subacute setting, they're not quite ready to be looking at that level of practice. So, you know, I think you're absolutely right what you've commented on. Thank you, Marlena. We've got a question from Peter. Hello, you mentioned needing assistance daily or several times a week. Our local hospitals don't have the capacity to provide this and NDIS appears to be cutting funding for many participants. So how have people funded this treatment? Yeah, um, do you mean in general, how do people fund? I mean, I, I can only speak from my perspective as a public hospital, so it's free. Um, and we've been able to just set it up as part of a public hospital and patients would um, come in and attend. Um, we, we use a lot of things like student-led clinics. Um, I can see, Peter, that you've raised your hand. Did you, um, did you want to ask the question or clarify it? Cheryl, are you able to unmute Peter? Hi, Peter. Yes. Hey, I think that might be a different Peter. I also had a oh, question, okay. but I'm not the same Peter that asked the question, but I'm happy to oh, go after okay. this other person. All right. All right. No problem. Um, so let me just, you hold on other Peter and I'll come back to other Peter's question. Um, so you, we were talking about, um, I think it's a combination of how do people afford it. So um, as I was saying, uh, I'm a public, I come from a public hospital background, so it doesn't cost anything. Uh, we do a lot of things in group settings. So we try to make it feasible. So for me, cost comes under feasibility. How, how do I, how can I, you know, provide this treatment without having more staff, without having, um, you know, having to have a $1 million grant. Um, so I was saying that I use uh, students as much as I can, um, allied health assistants, um, and I just look at the resources that we've got. And we've been able to actually establish, um, establish the clinic, as I said before, without funding, just through using some of those strategies. I'm not gonna say it was easy, um, you know, it was kind of blood, sweat and tears, but um, our whole team really invested in, in building that and, and it stuck. Did we want um, to go to the other Peter now that he's, he's there? Yes, yes, we'll go to um, Peter on the line. Hey, I'm not sure if you can hear me at the moment, um, but I just wanted to say thank you, Marlena, for the presentation. It went really, really nicely and you apologise for going over, but I think you spent the time on, on some really good areas, so thank you for that. Um, my name is Pete. I'm a community neurological OT who works out of Sydney, uh, predominantly specialised in catastrophic brain injury. And I guess the question that I have for yourself um, was more so around spasticity management. So I work in collaboration with quite a few rehab physicians and pain management specialists around managing complex and ongoing spasticity. And similar to the other person's question, not all the work that I do is under the NDIS. I work under certain workers' care and lifetime care schemes as well. But I guess what was and what do you believe to be the most beneficial way to manage spasticity in the community when you're not presently with clients every single day? So in addition to, to casting, um, you know, braces, all those kind of things, ROM braces for lower limb, collaboration with rehab specialists and Botox injections and all those kind of things, whether it's tendon releases as well. I find that I've got a lot of difficulty having carers and family members maintain compliance with those kind of things. And I guess I was just wondering, like, what's your approach around that in particular? Um, when, when I'm there with the clients, compliance is amazing and we're getting results. But as the other person had said earlier, like funding with NDIS is quite limited and even using allied health assistance or students is, is again, a bit of a tricky one. So is there any mm -hmm. particular methods that you find to be yeah. beneficial in that regard? Gosh, it's, it's such a such an interesting area and it is so hard, you know, the topic around spasticity um, and how to best manage it, um, you know, whether we're talking about from an inpatient or even more so, as you say, from an outpatient perspective, it's hard work for the patients to, to comply with um, the different regimes that we set up for them. And you already touched on um, where we have the strongest evidence, um, you know, around uh, serial casting. Um, and, you know, various sort of orthotic devices. Um, and of course, botulinum toxin is um, a mainstay for a lot of patients, particularly TBI patients. Um, one of the areas um, that we're looking at the, at the moment, and I, I don't have the results because we're mid-study, uh, mid is looking at um, a device called um, the Saboflex. Now, I'm a little bit hesitant to talk about it because um, 
you know, if you like, uh, you know, I'm going to sort of set the, the fox amongst the pigeons. So there, there was, you know, research to suggest that uh, using sort of orthotic devices or dynamic sort of um, orthoses um, wasn't helpful with, um, with managing tone um, and managing spasticity. Um, but there were suggestions that it could work for some patients. So I think it's really important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we've been looking at, we've, we're conducting a fairly small prospective trial uh, where we're looking at uh, patients with quite severe spasticity and using um, the SABO, um, the SABO Flex and uh, seeing how that um, can assist them. And I know that, I mean, I'm talking about an active research project as opposed to something that you know can be funded. But I do believe that some clinicians have been able to fund devices like the SaboFlex through NDIS to actually help with um, setting patients up to do further training using it at home. So that's one mm. possibility. But as I said, I have to declare that the evidence the evidence isn't there yet. You know, we, we, we need to keep looking at these sorts of devices and keep collecting our outcome measures so that we can establish an evidence base and, you know, be able to make recommendations. But otherwise, it's exactly as you said, um, you know, it's the botulinum to you know, toxin um, and then trying to maximise therapy after that. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've used the Saboflex quite a bit and have a few clients that have their active arm system as well. Um, but I was just yeah. seeing if there was anything else. I, re I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no problems. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. We have a question from Amber on the chat. In terms of the emerging technologies, are there any designs for improving cognition, like problem solving, concentration and intent, attention, et cetera, over yeah. improving on ROM, strength or neuroplasticity? Yes, yes. Um, oh, now I have to really think about it because um, I've done so much reading in the last few weeks. Um, yes, there is. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what I've seen anecdotally and I'll talk a little bit about what I've seen in the published evidence. Um, and I think it's in the stroke um, guidelines, possibly under a practice-based statement as opposed to a level of evidence about the use of um, kind of, you know, technology, you know, so cognitive um, training type of stuff um, to improve things like sustained attention and focus and, and memory. Um, and I, I, I can, I do recall that I looked at that area a few years ago. I can't remember what it was before. It might have been for some sort of a grant um, application, and it was a little bit mixed. Like a lot of these things that I've talked about tonight, there isn't always a really straightforward. This is the strongest evidence. Um, often it's a mixture of small studies showing some um, some improvements, other studies showing no improvements. Um, my own personal experience um, has been that. The patients that um, that I've had on gaming technology um, really does assist with things like perception. Um, so patients who experience neglect, um, I found that it's been really helpful. And I wish I took better measures around this. Um, that can be that's a great research project for somebody to do. Um, has really helped them to you know come to the midline, cross the midline, because often they're trying to they, they can hear the auditory response um, if they don't have an auditory neglect. Um, and can really help them to orientate to that. So um, from a perceptual, perceptual training perspective, absolutely. Um, and definitely intention as well um, improves over time. Um, but I can't categorically state um, what the research has shown, just a gut feel that there's something in the guidelines about it. Thank you, Marlena. We've got time for a couple of more questions. Um, we've got a question from Caroline on chat. Some complications happen post-stroke, which might affect patients and cause delay in rehabilitation engagement. How long, how long we could say could we say that neuroplasticity is still valid? So we know the stroke guidelines really emphasise the first six months, and, and I think that that's that's true. We we know there's a lot of spontaneous recovery in the first few weeks with resolution of edema and. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that just happens naturally. Um, and beyond that sort of um, acute phase, it's all, all about neuroplasticity. Um, we, and there's growing studies with chronic stroke patients that show ongoing capacity to be able to improve. So if we think about learning, if we look basically at motor learning, or if we look at um, learning for any of us, we continue to learn up until 
you know, we die, or up until we, um, you know, if we've, if we've acquired some sort of a, a neurodegenerative disorder, it might be more difficult. Um, but the argument or the growing argument is that neuroplasticity can continue endlessly. That doesn't mean that people should be in rehab endlessly. Um, people need time to consolidate what they've learned. So, you know, it's about you have a burst of rehab and then you have some time to integrate that into your, your daily living, into going home and what you're doing there. But there's evidence to suggest that these bursts of rehab are really beneficial to continue to work on um, making those neuroplastic changes. Um, I'm a huge believer, and I'm going to say this is probably a little bit subjective too, that patients can continue to change. Um, in the data that we collected, we had patients 20 years post brain injury um, that made um, statistically significant, but hugely meaningful changes in terms of participation. So how long is a piece of rope? <laughs> Thank you, Marlena. And this is our last question for the night from Lauren. Hi, Marlena. Can you tell us a bit more about your student-led clinics at Royal Melbourne Hospital? Yeah. Gosh, there's such a big push now um, for how we can use students. So um, student-led clinics, and this is a good one for people to think about uh, if you want to set up a CIMT, for example. Um, so the students can be involved in things such as completing the assessments. If we're going to provide um, some sort of a, a program over, let's say, a four or, two, or four to six week period, an intensive rehabilitation program. Think back to one of the examples that I gave around um, the, the patients, the chronic stroke patients who came in five days a week, five hours a day, five days a week over 12 weeks, that would be a perfect way to actually set up um, a student-led clinic. So the students can be trained to complete the assessments, um, to participate in delivering the rehabilitation and also to be doing the evaluations. Um, I think it's a really smart way to use students. Thank you, Marlena. And thank you all for your questions tonight. If we were not able to answer all your questions, we will respond to these outside of the webinar. We will also send a follow-up email with contact details and a certificate of attendance will be provided for your CPD records. Please join us for the second webinar in this series on Wednesday, the 18th of August. Stay tuned for a registration link coming soon. This now concludes our webinar. On behalf of Performance Health, Thank you, Dr. Clake, and thank you to our attendees for joining us tonight. Thank you and have a great evening.